Lord Clark, I'm going to ask you next about some recommendations emanating from the Council of Europe's Committee of Ministers in 1983. Um, if we start by looking at a, a, a minute, um, that's DHSC 0002309 underscore 086. Um, you'll see uh, that this is a minute from Mr. Cumming um, to, uh, I think, Mr. Patton's private office in part, um, dated the 2nd of July. But if we look at the top right-hand corner, handwriting, we can see copy to Mr. Alcock and Mr. Joyce. So that's to your private office and Lord Glenarth's private office. And it says this... From time to time, we submit to ministers international instruments which involve DHSS interests. It is normal practice during the preparation of these documents to ensure that the UK is not committed to policies which would not otherwise be followed, so that there is, of correspondingly, no action to be taken if and when they are adopted. However, recommendations or undertakings and international agreements are often of interest to pressure groups, and it is thought that ministers may wish to be aware of recommendation R838 which was adopted by the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe on the 23rd of June, 1983. Um, and then paragraph three, the subject of the recommendation is the prevention of transmission of AIDS from affected blood donors to patients receiving blood or blood products. On the basis of present knowledge, it's assumed that AIDS is transmissible by blood, and the recommendation aims to ensure that appropriate precautions are taken in the preparation of certain blood products, uh, and I think that's probably the word and or something like that um, handwritten, and that specific groups of recipients such as haemophiliacs are accordingly reassured. Uh, paragraph four says, refers to an information leaf that used by the American Red Cross appended uh, to the recommendation for the convenience of national blood transfusion services wishing to draw up their own leaflet. Five, the recommendation does not prevent the UK from continuing to import factor eight concentrate from the USA, on whom we currently rely for about 50% of our supply. And then six refers to attaching a copy of the recommendation. Um, now, I'm going to ask you to look at the recommendation. And this is July 83. This is yeah. July of 1983. I don't think we have a precise date. Um, but if we look at DHSC 0002309 underscore 029... we can see a, a minute dated the 22nd of July on behalf of Lord Glen Arthur to your private office, saying Lord Glen Arthur has seen Mr Cummings' minute of undated July and thinks we should accept the recommendation. He also feels that there might be merit in referring to the European advice when MSH announces the publication of our own leaflet to potential blood donors, does MSH agree? Uh, is that to me, then? Yes, that, does, that, yes, does that, I, do I agree? Um, you, you, you do, effectively. So that, that's the, the minute to your private office, and then the response... Uh, well, sorry, wasn't the recommendation that we stop using American supplies? No, I'm sorry. I, I, this is a different recommendation, oh. and I'm going to come on to the text of it in a moment. I just want to show the dates and, and who, it, who saw it, and then sorry. we'll look at the text. Sorry. No, no. So DHSC 0002309 underscore 031 is the response from your private office, if we just look at the dates, so 26th of July. MSH has seen your minute of the 22nd of July attaching Mr Cummings' submission and agrees that our own AIDS leaflet should refer to the European advice. So it, it would appear that you saw the minutes... Um, uh, and um, you're responding to what Lord Glenarthur had to say. Um, if, if we then go to the text of the recommendation itself, it's MACK 40307. Please, Shamek. And if we go to the next page, we'll see it's the Council of Europe Committee of Ministers, recommendation number R838. Is there any evidence that any minister participated in the Committee of Ministers? No. Because Britain was and still is a member of the Council of Europe. There was, an, a, Europe, there was a British delegate who was, in fact, Dr Gunson, uh, who was the consultant advisor, uh, uh, regional transfusion director and consultant yeah, advisor. Uh, the, the council, yeah, the Council, 
Well, he, um, he was actually the rapporteur, wasn't he, for, for this? Yes, you're right, sir. Sorry, he was. And he was a Department of Health uh, guy, was he? No, he was a regional transfusion director. But he was also had the status of consultant advisor on blood transfusion to the chief medical officer. And he was representing Britain on the Committee of Ministers? Well, I, I, I don't. he was present at their deliberations and reported back. He wasn't, I think, on the committee itself. I don't think we have to hand information about who was on the committee. Um, in, in any event, that, there's the title of it. If we just go further down the page, you'll, you'll see the date it was adopted on the 23rd of June, 1983. Um, uh, um, um, there are a number of preambles about, about, about AIDS um, set out, which I'm not going to ask you about. If we go to the next page... We'll see the recommendations. So that the, that recommends the governments of member states, one, to take all necessary steps and measures with respect to the acquired immune deficiency syndrome, and in particular, and then you'll see, Lord Clark, there are three recommendations set out. The first is to avoid wherever possible the use of coagulation factor products prepared from large plasma pools. This is especially important for those countries where self-sufficiency in the production of such products has not yet been achieved. And then the second recommendation is to inform attending physicians and selected recipients, such as haemophiliacs, of the potential health hazards of haemotherapy and the possibilities of minimising these risks. And then the third is to provide all blood donors with information on the acquired immune deficiency syndrome so that those in risk groups will refrain from donating. An example of an information leaflet for donors is appended. I'm not going to ask you any more, Lord Clark, about the third recommendation because I've already asked you about the AIDS leaflets in 1983, 84, 85. What I want to ask you about is the second recommendation. So you'll see there it's to inform attending physicians and selected recipients such as haemophiliacs of the potential health hazards of haemotherapy and the possibilities of minimising these risks. Um, first of all, Lord Clark, before we look at the, 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 the topic of the recommendation, um, in, in light of um, the, the minutes that we looked at, and the fact that this was sent to you, do you think you would have read the recommendations themselves? Yes, I wouldn't have. Yes, I wouldn't have said we accept the doctor of the recommendations without reading them. Yes, certainly. And, and broadly speaking, at, at, at that time, what, what kind of importance would the department have attached, or you yourself have attached, to recommendations of, uh, of the Committee of Ministers? Uh, the Council of Ministers, well, Although I have every respect to the body, I, I, I was a parliamentary for a very brief time. I, was, I used to go to the Council of Europe, but it's a rather obscure body, and the, the political deliberations and the committees of the Council of Europe, you know, don't have any binding effect, so it's not a high-profile thing. It can be very useful sometimes. I, it's a good job we're still members of it, but um, it, it's, it's not mainstream politics uh, and, and unless you get into it. Uh, uh, and... Uh, so this, this, is, this isn't a major international decision-making body, not, not the, the, the Parliamentary Assembly or the, the Minister's Committee. In fact, the fact that at the time we seem to have been spending, one of our advisors, obscure medical advisors to it, to actually act as our representative, shows that the title Council of Ministers was a bit, a bit high-flung, but... Uh, I personally regarded it as a useful international forum. When I did it, uh, I was in the Whip's office as well, as it happens. I was a member of the government at the same time as being an MP when I went to the Parliamentary Assembly. I used to find interesting and a very useful way of developing more international contacts and a better way of understanding the politics of other countries and exchanging ideas with people I wouldn't normally work with. That's what the Council of... I mean, there are important aspects of the Council of Europe, mainly the European Court of Human Rights, which is a Council of Europe institution. That, that issues binding judgments. But this kind of advisory recommendatory stuff is, is all right. It, it, it exists. It's a bit fringe. Um, it would appear from the exchange of, of minutes that we looked at, however, that, that the that the the response within the Department of Health was essentially to accept these recommendations. Yes, and, uh, and Simon and I seem to have thought we're OK. Um, um, and so if we then look at the second recommendation to inform attending physicians, you'll see from that, Lord Clark, and, and, and let me know if you disagree, um, it, it, it's a recommendation to governments to take all necessary steps and measures 
to inform two cohorts of, of people, do doctors. Well, relevant to here, doctors patients. and haemophiliacs. Yes. Um, and it's to inform them of t two um, categories of, of, of information, the potential health hazards of treatment and the possibilities of minimising the risks of AIDS. Um, now, would, would you have essentially just assumed, do you think, that that was being done because you weren't being asked to take any... Well, were there any, were there any doctors and haemophiliacs who didn't know there was all this concern about American Factor 8 and minimising the risks? There wasn't much we could do unless you stopped taking Factor 8. Well, I'm going to explore with you some... What, 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 what... Uh, but this is... I mean, I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with the recommendation, but... Didn't live to know quite what more one could have done on either of them. Should the department not have taken at least some steps, having accepted the recommendation, to satisfy itself that physicians and haemophiliacs, two distinct cohorts there, were um, uh, uh, aware of both the risks and ways in which those risks could be minimised? Well, what... The difficulty was, as we've seen from our earlier discussions, that we didn't, couldn't find any way of minimising the risks short of stopping using American Factor 8. What possibilities of minimising risks could we have possibly told the haemophiliacs about, apart from if they were homosexual if haemophiliacs, which is, well, I'm sure some were, uh, do we, you know, try and stick to one partner? Um, actually, they're heterosexual, because actually heterosexuals get AIDS as well, which we were always anxious to point out in the 1980s to counter the dreadful homophobia that surrounded all this. Uh, but I, I'm not quite sure what possibility of minimising risks we could have put to the haemophiliacs. And I don't think many... Because we didn't know the scale of the infection of inverted product, I don't think any haemophiliac would have stopped taking factor eight. Let's just look at it in stages. What, what, what are the possibilities of minimising the risks we should have put out? I'll explore that with you in a moment, Lord Clark. Let's just start with the first part of the recommendation, which is to provide information about potential health. Well, they were all over the newspapers. The inquiry has heard evidence from both family, families, patients, clinicians, which it might be said paint a fairly overwhelming picture of people not having risks drawn to their attention. Well, they must have been fairly switched off. I mean, you're asking them what they knew 40 years ago, in a particular date in 1983. But as we've seen from the early discussions, one of the things that was concerning, said Norman, not just me, was the outrageous presentation of this problem as far as the general public was concerned. I, I, I mean, we, we haven't got the government. I don't recommend you get all the press cuttings. But uh, the, the, uh, I, I mainly remember of one today because I cited one, you know, gay blood kills donors. And that the, 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 whilst we still weren't certain, there was no conclusive proof that it did. Uh, there was a tremendous mayhem being kicked up. That's why we were anxious to present these things carefully and avoid causing an absolute panic. And there's no, there's no point in raising awareness of health hazards any higher unless you're also going to suggest what people do about it. Isn't so it's no good going out there... Uh, I say, but sadly, this tragedy is just appalling what actually happened, but... What well, you've done, just got out and said, we think it's important in the public interest that we tell you that you're going to die. And then they say, what am I meant to do about it? And we say, I'm afraid we don't think there's anything you can do because unless you want to stop taking factor eight. Isn't the point about ensuring that this cohort of patients were informed of the risks of their NHS treatment to enable them to take an informed decision... About whether to stop taking as factor eight. ...as to whether to... to take less or take none, Taking less or whether to give it to their child or not? Well, 
I, I, the physicians, if they were remotely keeping up to date with things, must have been aware that this was this mounting concern. So they all had specialist doctors who were treating them. They didn't just give themselves factor eight. I don't think, I don't know. Personally, I have to admit, I don't know how you take factor eight. So I, 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 I apologize if in fact that you're given a pill which you take home. But they, they all had highly specialized physicians treating them. And physicians, unless they were getting woefully out of date, must have been fully informed, better informed than I am about what they thought the risks were. And some of them may have shared this with the patients, but again, the physicians would take the view, what is the point of scaring the patient if one doesn't quite know what you're suggesting to the patient they should do? You're saying, well, they should choose whether to take the treatment or not, but the, 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 the factor aid made such a difference to the quality of life and the life expectancy of haemophiliacs, I, I can't, Im and they would have, you know, the consequences of stopping taking factor eight were, were very serious for them. I find it difficult to imagine anybody, when the suggestion came up, the haemophiliac society was ferociously against any idea that you stopped people taking imported factor eight. Uh, and had we, had we banned taking imported factor eight, we'd have been faced campaigns as vehement as the ones we do now, but on the other side, saying, what were we doing? Destroying the life expectancy and the quality of life of haemophiliacs. Because at that stage, there were very, very few cases of anybody actually dying. Would you accept as a matter of principle, and as this recommendation appears to suggest, that the, the patient d deciding whether to yes, treat Yes, you should tell the patient of the risks of treatment. Child. They should be told the risks of treatment. And that seems the to that was true then. It's got ever, it's the best practice of medicine. It's much, it's much stronger now. You, if, when you're having treatment now, you get carefully to the patient consent involves carefully explaining all the risks. That was a very good principle in the 1980s. It wasn't always followed, so they'd often operate on the patient without bothering to tell the patient what the risks were of the operation. And nowadays, if you ever are unlucky enough to need an operation, you'll find it you're carefully taken through it and asked to consent. Uh, but the way in which you tell the patient of the risks, you know, you have to be... There's no point in, in just terrifying them without being able to suggest anything you can do. So, yes, it would, in principle, the physician should have been discussing with the patient. You know, you know there's a risk. There appears to be some concern that it's possible. You, you, you might be infected. I, we just don't know. You indicated in, in an earlier answer that there was material out there in the media, and I think you used the phrase about being switched on. I apologise if I haven't quite accurately... Um, repeated what you said. W would you accept that it, it shouldn't be for patients uh, taking decisions about their own treatment or taking decisions about the treatment of their children to learn about risks from the no, mail no, on no, Sunday no, 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 rather no, than look to no, no, either so their clinician... So sorry, can I just finish the question? Sure. To either their clinician or to the department and the chief medical... Well, it's the clinician. The, 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 the person who's responsible... The department has no say in the treatment that the clinician gives to his or her patient. Similarly, it is the duty of informing the patient of any risks falls on the clinician. And that is true today. And clinicians take it more seriously. One reason is because we've got ever more litigious in the previous years. So warnings about risks now become copious because the lawyers will advise the doctors uh, the, 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 the way of making sure they're not held legally liable if the treatment doesn't work is to explain these risks carefully before you do it and get genuine, fully informed consent. In the 80s, it wasn't quite like that. But, but uh, the, the duty uh, is on the physician, firstly, to decide what treatment, secondly, to order the risks. And I, you know, I'm not saying this, shove it all onto doctors. That is part of the... I have the highest regard for doctors, and that is one of their very, very heavy burdens of responsibility that they carry as they act in the best interests of their patients giving treatment. But this was a recommendation accepted by the department that governments of member states 
should inform haemophiliacs of the potential health hazards of chemotherapy. The department should have done something. Should what should the department have done? Issue guidance, issue information, ascertain what information was being provided by haemophilia clinicians through the UK HCDO to patients. Well, I, I don't think the doctors treating haemophiliacs would need that guidance. It would be bizarre if a haemophiliac specialist... I mean, we've, you've taken me through all these subcommittees of expert or rest of it. it was, there was a perfectly live debate, as it happens, it got into the general newspapers. Does it... Uh, and uh, the, 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 the haemophiliac patients, what do you want to sort of post a leaflet to them all? Does it not trouble you, then, that the department took apparently no action to comply with this Well, or, or, uh, obviously, Simon and I signed up, because we, 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 we were trying to avoid the use of, of these... Uh, the, the first one, we were trying to get self-sufficiency in production, and the, the third one, uh, we, 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 we were trying to stop at-risk groups donating. We, obviously, the second one's harmless, but now I, I think that w when we got a message and just said, yes, we we'll agree the recommendations, we were not agreeing it in detail. And in detail, of course, when you say, well, what's the department to do, it is difficult to say, well, quite, what should the department have done? Let's look at the second aspect of it, then, which is... Not the least because there was no certainty about what the full potential health hazards were. We, if we look at the, the second limb of the information to be provided under this recommendation, information about the possibilities of minimising these risks... You, I'm not sure said, what they were. Well, that's exactly what I'm going to try and explain. Uh, did the Council part. of Europe have any suggestions as to what they might be? I, not, not to my knowledge, no. No. I don't think um, anybody did. Well... Um, what what did you think at the time, Lord Clark, were the risks to haemophiliacs if imported concentrates were not available or were uh, or reduced supplies were available? Well, I, you asked me at the time. I do my best at the time. I mean, none of us can avoid the wisdom of hindsight. And, and actually, preparing for this committee, uh, with, once you start bombarded with thousands of documents, and then I start with the help of DH lawyers working through the answers to all your questions, so being shown masses of documents, some great majority of which I've not seen before, a certain amount of amateur, you know, not expertise, but my knowledge of the whole subject is hugely improved. And, of course, hindsight, I have knowledge of the terrible tragedy that eventually occurred when people started dying in, in large numbers uh, from, from taking... Uh, uh, from polluted AIDS. So, look, looking back, the, 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 the issues were that did seem to be there was a worry. It was worrying from the word go that we were so dependent on imported blood products from America, and we quite early discovered that there was no alternative supply that could provide us with sufficient quantity. So the decision had been taken, it was finally taken, I think, just after I arrived in the department, to go for self-sufficiency, which involved rebuilding or doing major work at the Blood Products Laboratory at Elstree. So we, we, we wanted to be self-sufficient and produce our own. Um, uh, uh, but, but it was worrying. That, that there was a risk. And then we started having these quite few cases. But they were disturbing because haemophiliacs who'd taken... American Factor 8, were indeed getting AIDS, maybe you know, just three, two or three of them. Now, of course, we had no idea to what extent our American replies were, were polluted, were, were contaminated. Were we just every now and again, every six months, the odd batch would turn up, and uh, you know, which really shouldn't be given because it's contaminated, or was a lot of it contaminated? Was it, we, no one had a clue. Was it the case that this was causing the the, 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 the the disease? Well, it did look, certainly it was a possibility. It, was, it looked as though it might be quite probable, but no doubt you'll get on later. That there was no conclusive evidence that it was causing it, and it may be, you know, this was the problem with new diseases. More of the research was going on to actually try and see what it was. 
And, and uh, so it was difficult to inform the world of this because there was no certainty about it. And also there was no ready solution. The only solution we were then aware of, that I, well, certainly I was aware of, was to just go for self-sufficiency. And that involved improving our British blood donations, although we, ours we weren't, didn't have the same problem. Look, look the the solution in te well, eventually was heat treatment. But that's what solved it all. But I knew nothing about heat treatment. And that was a matter of uh, some brilliant scientist somewhere so, discovered that heat treatment stopped anybody being affected with hepatitis or HIV. And you, I mean, we now take blood donations in this country from homosexuals because look, look, you look, heat my, treat it and it can't infect anybody. My, my question was not what were the... Um, what would happen to, to haemophiliacs if they carried on taking important... But at this time, my question well, there's is, no, nothing really you could say to anybody. No, my question is this. What did you think the risks were to haemophiliacs if they didn't have access to factor eight concentrates? Well, you better ask a doctor what the risks are. You have to take a lot of medical officers. My lay understanding, and I don't know whether I had it at the time or whether I acquired it, and I think I did have it at the time, it was explained to me because we... It, it, you know, but what's, what's the factor eight for? I can't be amazed if that didn't come up at some stage. My understanding, though I wasn't remotely involved in the 70s, I have no idea what went on in the 70s, the impression I think I had at the time, the impression I have now, is that it was a kind of wonder treatment that had emerged in the late 1970s for haemophiliacs. Uh, before that, the life expectancy of haemophiliacs was very poor. A lot of them died off in their 20s. The ability of a haemophiliac to lead an ordinary life was very, very limited because they had to avoid risk of bleeding incidents. And factor eight was a kind of wonder product, particularly once it started being used, well before, in the late 70s again, as a prophylactic, a preventative medicine. And if you took it regularly as a prophylactic, haemophiliacs lived longer, they could lead an ordinary life, if they were schoolboys, they could play football. Uh, if, more importantly, if they were adults, they could start having a job and a career and leading, as long as they were careful, unfortunately it's a terrible, terrible condition course the lives of haemophiliacs all blighted by this condition but they were live much nearer a normal life have a much improved quality of life and on average live very much longer if they took factor eight that is what i think factor eight was and but unfortunately when these doubts arose, when people discovered the American practice of taking blood donations, there was no alternative source of supply that could meet the demand we now had for factor eight once the doctors were starting to prescribe it as a prophylactic. You said, I think, on a number of occasions... But anyway, they, they, I'm, I'm going around on much bigger, wider subjects, which I think are the point of this inquiry and which the inquiry will go into and form its views on but that you did ask me what's the background to why what could we actually have done uh, by way of informing people with haemophilia of the possibility of minimizing risks you've referred on i think more than one occasion in the course of your evidence to to your understanding that without concentrates haemophiliacs would have died is, is that right that was your their life their life expectancy is greatly improved i mean don't, don't just drop dead through not taking it but i think but just i, I tell you I'm, I'm not a clinician so if i'm wrong i'm wrong i'm, I'm sorry i don't i'm sure nobody's going to take any notice of my clinical opinions if i'm unwise enough to express any i'm saying my understanding was that the life expectancy of haemophiliacs is greatly improved. Was it was believed at the time? Was I think I have no reason to doubt it. I, I, I think it's still true now. Their life expectancy was improved if they were given factor eight as a, uh, both as a treatment. But the, 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 by the early eighties, it started being used as a prophylactic. Uh, and do, do we correctly understand from something you said earlier that you were not aware of uh, a treatment called cryoprecipitate? 
Never heard of it. That, that is, is that the treatment that preceded Factor VIII? Preceded and continued. Sorry? Preceded, preceded, but also continued to be used to some extent. Continues to use day to day, is it? No, continued to be used during the period of time with which we're concerned. Continue to be used during the period of time which I'm asking you about. I don't think I've ever heard of it. I mean, I mean I've seen, I've seen, I think I saw the look in the documents yesterday, we reference to it, but I have no idea what that is. Were you aware that haemophiliacs could not all simply be lumped together as, as suffering an identical condition, but there were ranges of severity, mild, moderate, and severe, with different no, I was vaguely aware of that, yeah. And there are potentially a number of measures which might have been taken. Um, I'm just going to list a handful of them and see whether any of them are ones which you recall being discussed at the time, Lord mm -hmm. Clark. So one was reversion of use to cryoprecipitate in, in, to a greater extent. I, I have no recollection of that ever being put to me. I, 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 say I, I, I don't know what that treatment is. I've, I, I've only heard of it uh, being referred here. Reducing the amount of concentrates which uh, were provided to an individual patient by, for example, not treating them prophylactically not having home treatment, but treating the severe bleeds. Severing, treating bleeding instances. Yeah. Yes, or treating life-threatening bleeding inst instances, for example, but no. not treating all bleeds. So that, that's another measure. Uh, that's the equivalent of stopping taking it, except when you have a severe life-threatening situation. Postponing elective surgery so as to reduce the need to have concentrates um, um, uh, at least temporarily. That's another measure that could have been taken. S sorry, what, this is for haemophiliacs yes. that, that need elective surgery. I, I don't remember that. I, I suppose that, that, that is right. But Reserving, um, uh, re uh, limiting exposure to multiple batches of concentrates by keeping haemophiliacs on only, an individual patient on only one batch or one type of concentrate. That's a a measure that might reduce risk, not eliminate it. Was that something that was ever ventilated? Mm. Do you recall any discussion of the use of a treatment called DDABP or desmopressin? So, uh, what, called what? DDAVP was uh, a treatment that could be used for mild haemophiliacs from the late 70s onwards. Um, d d did, did you or to your knowledge the department ever ask officials to investigate what other steps could possibly be taken short of the radical step of stopping the importation of concentrates? Well, I think we were told there was, that, was, that was the only thing you could do. That's why everybody had gone so big on self-sufficiency, that their solution was to stop needing... American Factor Eight. I, 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 I don't remember anybody ever raising anything other than that or stop using it for fully or partially, as you say. Now, I don't remember any halfway, halfway houses would have been interesting, but I don't remember, I was certainly, again, because bear in mind, I was not directly responsible anywhere. I don't know whether Simon ever was taken through possible alternatives or what the doctors have said when you put the possible alternatives to them but the, my understanding was that the, uh, there was this mounting what concern about the possibility even becoming the probability it was causing this problem to a few haemophiliacs and it, the, the only solution was to stop using factor 8 that you couldn't do that because of the drastic effect it would have on the quality of life of haemophiliacs, uh, 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 and uh, that, you know, just get on as quickly as we can in minimizing uh, our reliance on the imported product. I don't, these other things you're suggesting, certainly I didn't have any discussion of that kind, but I. I d didn't have meetings on blood products and haemophiliacs, and it wasn't my subject, and I, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't have come to me anyway in the Le first place. Leaving aside the question of, whether you, of who should have asked the question, do you accept that the department 
should have investigated whether there were alternative measures. Well, I think that's on. better. On these are these are clinical uh, issues than the clinical solutions to the problems we're concerned. I say that the one thing about ministers in the Department of Health is they're not meant to play amateur doctors. Uh, so the the, the, the the subcommittee of the biological, whatever it was, you know, that's the sort of place where you look at those things. Uh, and if you then come up with recommendations, eventually, you know, you go up to some minister to get it signed off, but the chances are the minister's not going to argue with the cl expert clinical advice. Um, that's where these things are handled. Uh, and the medical officers in the department, th their life is devoted to these things. If they have bright ideas about how to deal with some clinical problem, yes, they discuss it and see if they all agree uh, and whether they should put out some information letter or something suggesting this, but th that's where it's all handled. But the idea that ministers are meant to sit down, thinking of all, would think, sit down, start devising alternative ways of dealing with it is unlikely. And what you're question, asking me is, was it ever raised? No, it wasn't raised, but you may be going on to ask me, am I surprised it wasn't raised? And the, not, not greatly, because it's not something that essentially is within the expertise or responsibility of ministers to do come up with these clinical answers to things. My, my question was not whether you as a minister should have investigated whether there were alternative measures, other ways of reducing risk short of the radical solution or the more radical solution of, of banning imported concentrates. Well, my question was whether... Did, what, what, did, what did Diana Walford say? Well, I'm, I'm very welcome to read the transcript of her evidence, Lord Clark. It's published on the Inquirer's website. My question to you is the question of principle... Do you think, as someone who has led many government departments over the years, including the Department of Health, do you accept that the department, through whatever means, the chief medical officer, medical officers, health services branch, whoever, junior ministers, whoever it might be, should have inquired into the question of whether there were measures that could be taken short of banning imports to reduce the risk? No, I'm sure, I'm sure they did. I mean, just, but the, the, the impression I received as a minister, admittedly a peripheral minister who was only getting involved when he chose to get involved in things like leaflets, uh, the impression I had was that, that the only way of guarding against this mounting concern about possible risk was to stop using factor eight, and that would involve stopping giving it because we had no alternative supply for about half our supplies to American imports. And I was... Uh, not, a, but I mean, somewhere in the department, they, 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 they must have considered whether there was some halfway house. I'd have thought. I don't know. And uh, I, no doubt you will ask to, and have asked the medics, whether they did, and what happened to it. Just, just two documents um, before we finish for the day, um, Lord Clark. Um, We're finishing the day. Be before we finish for the day, two documents I want to ask you to look at. Um, the first is at ITVN 0000041. Um, this is an exchange of uh, communications um, between you and the producers. Oh, I've, I've seen this yesterday, yes. yeah. The producers of a, of a, of a documentary. Um, uh, and if we could go to the third page, just wanted to ask you, for present purposes, about one of the things you said in your um, response to the producer. So page three of this. Ah, oh, we've only got two pages. Oh, sorry, um, it's, it'll be a separate number. ITVN, uh, 000, ITVN 5045, sorry. So th this was your response, um, and I just want to ask you about the third paragraph, which begins, I did not ever attend. So you say this, I did not ever attend any full policy discussions on the question of blood products for the treatment of haemophilia, although I was aware that there was a discussion going on on the subject. Um, and then um, you say these events are over 30 years ago. I have no recollection of ever being shown or told of the opinion of the Communicable Disease Surveillance Centre. 
um, I think that's a reference to the letter from um, Dr. Spence Galbraith. Oh, that's Dr. Galbraith's letter, it is. Isn't it? Yep. Um, in clinical issues of this kind, all ministers rely heavily on the advice of the chief medical officer and the medical and scientific experts in the department. So that, that was what you said there. That's what I've been saying all day. I want to ask you about what you mean in the first sentence where you say, I did not ever attend any full policy discussions, or, although you were aware there was a discussion going on on the subject. Well, what, what do you mean by full policy discussions on the question of... Well, the, the, the kind of policy discussions I had on other subjects, pay claims, strikes, hospital closures, whatever... I would call a meeting, the relevant officials would come in after putting papers to me, uh, making recommendations of action, and we'd discuss it and form a consensus solution. I was, never did that. Uh, as we've been discussing all day, I would choose to get involved when some of my office pointed out and they did show me one of the documents copied to me because they thought I'd be interested. We spent a very high proportion of the day going on the fact that I did actually get myself involved on the question of the handling, not the content, of the, particularly of the leaflet that we were putting out to prevent, to try and stop gays giving blood. Uh, and, and, and I, I don't recall any policy meeting, me as a minister, I don't recall anybody ever asking me to take a decision on blood products. Uh, I, I don't think I ever took a decision on blood products, apart from clearing the issue of leaflets and things that came along. I don't remember attending a formal policy discussion in which we discussed what do we do about these mounting concerns. We have American stuff. Should we start stop importing it so that the doctors have to stop prescribing using it? Uh, and in that kind, what are the consequences of doing that? Although, as we've seen in various parts of the department, medics and specialists were considering that. I, I just wasn't the blood products minister. It, it so so that, that, that uh, she would have said, that, that, that's what I told them, and that's what I still say. This, this was in 2020. What I've had to put up with, and it gets exasperates me at times, is purely by chance, I have remained the best known person of all those people involved. I'm a kind of ageing, fading, B-list celebrity now. They're the only people the general public have heard of who were involved are Norman Fowler and myself. And so there's a tendency for the campaigners and for the press to try to want to attach everything to do to this to me. And so because I was in the department at the time, I took all the decisions. If not me, Norman will have to do, you know, and the, the people try to influence inquiries or always trying to steer them to find some celebrity whose fault it was. Uh, so this was the latest attempt with, as you saw, the detailed things they wanted me to answer questions about. That was my response, perfectly accurate response, the role I played all those years before. It, blood products took a tiny, tiny proportion of my total time in the op when I was in the office, as it were, in DHSS. Irrespective of the question of whether you um, would or would not have attended such full policy discussions, would you have expected there to have been such discussions involving perhaps the, 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 the minister with special responsibility? Well, again, I know, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not asking I don't know what Simon said. I've re I have read his written evidence, but I, whether Simon ever had that direct discussion, do we stop using imported factor eight? Uh, sitting here now, I, I'm not quite, I should remember from what his evidence, but I'm not sure whether he ever had that, but he, he might have had it. Uh, did, whether did he ever have a meeting where they considered was there any alternative to just a yes, yes or no, use the imported stuff or not? I don't know whether he had such discussions, but. Uh, I never had them, not formal ones. The nearest I ever had was what I, we were talking about earlier on, which I, was Simon sharing what he was doing and what he wasn't doing with me and apparently with John Patton as well. But that was in general terms, you know, ministers talking as, as friends and colleagues. Uh, what do you think? And I, I, I'm having to face this problem. I, I don't know whether Simon can remember what we actually said. You don't remember conversations, even interesting ones like that, from 40 years ago. Uh, but that was the nearest I ever got to being involved. And uh, 
uh, and I, it, was the, it was the most all-round view I ever got of everything going on in the whole subject, I think, but I can't remember now what anybody actually said. But <laughs> anyway, this, sorry to give such a long answer again, as I'm probably irritating you by giving long answers to many of your questions. That statement that I gave to this TV channel trying to produce a sensationalised uh, investigative journalism thing involving me in 2020 is totally accurate. If things were done by the department that, that either should not have been done or could have been done better, or, or things not done, matters not considered by the department, does the Minister of State or the Secretary of State not bear some responsibility for the actions Well, we're a team, yes, so yes. I mean, it's, it's, it's greatly regrettable if the department doesn't do things. Yes, I, I, I'm not saying... So, I don't get me wrong. I'm just explaining what the factual situation is. I'm not not trying to escape saying one me gov. I don't think the department did anything wrong. I'm, I don't, I've never heard anybody suggest anything that in the real world, a minister or a civil servant might have done that would have prevented it. And I've already said, had we taken the step we now know would have saved lives, we'd have been treated as an outrage by the Haemophilia Society and most haemophiliacs by denying them their factor eight. There just wasn't the evidence to justify that. I don't think the department did anything wrong. I don't think there's anything the department could have done that it didn't do. Uh, it's, it, it, it's the way of the current way of the life now. It's part of current political scene that somebody's got to be summoned, to use the old sayings. Someone's got to be found to blame for this, and it's all the fault of the government, really, or sometimes it's all the fault of the Tory party, depending on who's in power at the time. I don't think anything really is wrong. We all now, with the benefit of hindsight, know what happened. I hope the ministers in the present government know they're going to be put through all this on COVID. There'll be a public inquiry, it'll take five years, spend tens of millions of pounds, and the media will be urging it on to get Boris Johnson hung from the yard arm and to give compensation to everybody who ever had COVID. That's the way of the world. In the real world, the calmness of this inquiry, that was my involvement. If anybody failed to do anything, yes, I was a member of the Department of Health, I was part of the team. Secretary of State, when you come on to be being my Secretary of State, overall responsibility in the end the buck stops with you you're not only, not only the head of everything you're in the last resort you are the person overall responsible and in a big department like department of health one of it some of your juniors some of your officials are going to make a mistake they're going to make a pig's ear of something you pr probably won't have a clue what it was until you're told when you walk into the office one morning and you have to start trying to sort it out and you're, you're responsible you can't get away from the fact that you're in the last resort Secretary of State is overall responsibility. As Minister of State, as a middle-ranking minister, I don't seek to escape any responsibility, and if something went wrong, uh, then I, you know, I'm, imp I'm implicated, I share the blame. But my actual personal role is the one that's described, and I never, I wasn't the one holding policy discussions and taking decisions about whether we import or not. I was aware this discussion was going on, that's all. So I'm given the time, and I've got, got a slightly different topic to move on to and some documents to look at, um, it might be the right moment at which to break. Uh, yes. Um, just, just one thing, if I, if I may, Lord Clark, just, just ask you. Um, as best you can, it's very difficult with hindsight to put yourself back into the position in which you were in, uh, in the middle 1983. But you've already um, expressed a, a very great deal of surprise uh, at the communication from the Public Health Laboratory Service uh, by Dr. Galbraith. Uh, and indeed, uh, I think your surprise went so far as to wonder uh, why it, it never come to light through uh, Lord Glen Arthur, or, or for that matter, to yourself. The question I want to ask you against that background and against the background of the concern that there was at the time about AIDS, is this. You've, um, you've asked, you, you're not shy of asking quite a lot of questions. You've asked quite a lot to counsel as she's been questioning you. I'm sorry about that. No, no don't worry, it's, it's just what you are. Um, and it's that, really, that just intrigues me. Suppose that the, this 
document which rather shocked you when you looked at it had come to you. Do you think you would have said to your departmental officials, or for that matter, um, had a, a meeting at which uh, Galbraith uh, attended? I rather doubt that would have happened, but do you think you would have said, what's the alternative? You'd have asked questions, perhaps, would you? Well, I ask questions. I, th I think you have a duty with lay, with all officials. That you, one of your duties of the minister, when you are doing things you're responsible for, is to challenge. And so you ask questions. It's an uh, instance in the questions I've been asked here. Just me, you know, do we need screening and heat treatment? That's a question. And, and, and that is explained clearly. Right, finally, uh, I understand that. Um, so so had, I, had I seen that, Yes, I think if anybody had seen that, uh, any, you know, but, but they said, grief, you know, this is all rather serious. What, 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 what do we make of this? And no doubt, he'd be, had I been shown it, and had I asked that, I'd have been told it had all been seriously considered by the Cup Committee, but I'm, being me, uh, and, and Simon as well, but for all I know, but I'm, I, mean, I say I always ran my departments as a debating society, and I'm quite garrulous and, and quite combative. Uh, that, that I'd have wanted them to persuade me that, the, that they were correct in answering, because what he said probably would have been the first intimation I'd had of the scale of the possible risk we were running. I mean, obviously, we'd have behaved totally differently in 1980. If anybody had told us, you do realize 2,800 people are going to die because they're being given this product. Of course, the behavior of everybody in the department would have been dramatically different. That's, that's the wisdom of hindsight. But that had been, in the balance of risk, which is you know, what they're having to make decisions on today on COVID, let alone this new disease then, I would have totally transformed what we did. And if, if, if you told anybody in the department, there wasn't an official or a minister who wouldn't have, you know, sort of just taken off if you'd said, if you don't do anything, 2,800 people are going to die. Of course, you would, there's nobody who wanted anybody to die. Just, uh, just, but just, that, that Galbraith gets nearest to giving us an intimation. He thought that was likely to happen. And unfortunately, I don't think that ever reached me. I don't think it ever reached, apparently it didn't reach Simon. And it was dealt with by the subcommittee of the biological WhatsIt, uh, who do include extremely distinguished health experts. And Mr. Galbraith appears to have gone along with it. But uh, I, I think you've confirmed the, the question that, that I asked, that being who you are... Sorry, I'll try and give you a short answer. No, no. Don't worry about that. Being who you are, you would have asked questions. Oh, I'd have asked serious questions. To see what the, alternative, what the alternative was. And you wouldn't have been satisfied necessarily with the first answer because it's a no, debate. No, 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 I never am. Yeah. Well, that's, that's all that I, I asked. And, and yeah, you, I'm you sorry. Absolutely. No, that's, that's sorry. absolutely fine. Well, we'll take a break uh, there and come back at 10 o'clock tomorrow. 10 o'clock, please. 10 o'clock. Yes,